This is Brian Wormers recording a lecture on the musculoskeletal system for the course of pediatrics. Some of our main objectives of this will be listing some of the effects of immobilization on a child, understanding traumatic musculoskeletal injuries including fractures, formulating a teaching plan for parents of a child in a cast, looking at the function of traction, discussing DDH, congenital clubfoot, osteogenesis imperfecta, lev cab parathes disease, and skiffy. Describe the therapy and nursing care of a child with scoliosis. Outline a plan of care for a child with osteomyelitis. And then describe the nursing care of a child with tumor, septa joint, JIA, or SLE. Immobility is very difficult on a child because oftentimes they want to run, play, and go do things instead of just laying in bed or resting quietly. Otherwise, physiologically, there's some important considerations on, of the effects of immobility on a child. With the musculoskeletal system, they have decreased strength and mobility and endurance after a course of immobility. With their skeletal system, they do de demineralize their bones and they can see uh, an effect on their calcium. Within their metabolism, they have a decreased rate and they tend to be hypercalcemic. With their cardiovascular system, they can have some venous stasis, some edema, and some issues with distribution. For the respiratory system, they have decreased capacity and muscle strength. For gastrointestinal system, they can have feeding difficulties, some anorexia where they're not hungry, and some stooling problems, as for some kids it's very difficult to stool while in a bed. For integumentary system, they can have decreased circulation and pressure uh, wounds. For the urinary system, sometimes it's difficult to void in a supine position. And psychologically, they can have some regression to cope with this, have some altered perceptions, frustration, and depression. So looking at traumatic injury, this is basic first aid that you guys have received. Um, looking at the makeup, of course you've got bones, you've got tendons, you've got ligaments. Know that tendons are related to strains. The way that I've done this is the T in strains lines up a tendon where ligament and sprain go together. You can have joint dislocations and then if you have fractures, you always worry about going through that growth plate because that can cause ling limb length discrepancies. As we scroll down, here's some treatment, you know, just focus in on rices. And then down below, there is a good image of a elbow dislocation. This often happens from a jerking motion when an adult or somebody taller um, jerks the child to come with them and dislocates the elbow. Um, the treatment is very easy. I love doing this procedure because uh, although it hurts the child in the short go round, by the end of their visit they are using that arm. They're happy again. Um, and you can see on this video that um, it's a relatively simple procedure. Fractures are very common in kids. Um, you're going to see this in lots of different things uh, in lots of different ages. Um, just make sure that it's appropriate. Uh, if they're not cruising, they're not bruising. So that means that it should not happen in infants or, or in kids that don't have the ability to generate force enough to break a bone. So weakest part of the bones is that growth plate. So that's why it's common. We talked about why that was important and significant on earlier slides related to limb length discrepancies. There's lots of different types of fractures. So on a closed, non-display, so everything's lined up and it's within the body. Open means that part of the bone is sticking out of the body. Comminuted means that there's a great deal of crushing force and there's lots of little pieces. Displaced just means that it's not lined up. Oblique goes across the bone. A spiral fracture indicates that there's some kind of a twisting or rotational force that causes this. Um, there is a link that some people will say that uh, spiral fracture is always abuse and neglect. 
it's not always, but you have to have a reason and you have to have something that will line up with a rotational injury that would cause this. Impacted, so like if they fell and you get a pushing, crushing force. And then green stick is very common in kids. And green stick means that it breaks part of the way through and then it kind of goes upward. Just like if you were to take a, a stick off of a tree and try and break it in half when it's uh, fairly green, it doesn't break nicely in half. It breaks a little bit, but then it kind of goes up. And that's what you're seeing in this diagram, in this picture. So I hope all of you guys have gone through this already. I was wondering if you guys could see uh, my daughter broke her wrist this summer. I was wondering if you guys could see it. So as we scroll down, the one thing I was going to point out to you was this fracture. Um, on this, you can kind of see these growth plates here, the bone. But where she broke it was right here. And so um, the way that one of the my teachers, when I was in nurse practitioner school, said is that God lights uh, bones and lines that are, are smooth and even. And on this one, you can kind of see that it's just raised up a little bit. It's got that fracture in there. So... She was in a cast for a few weeks, came out, and has not had any significant impairment from that. Kids do heal their bones faster than most adults. If you kind of look at this chart here, you can kind of see how fast they do. Also, I really want you guys to remember the six P's. That will be on your exam. So looking at pain and point of tenderness at uh, that area. Pulselessness, so lacking a pulse. Pallor which color changes, they can get dusky or blue. Paresthesia, so sensation changes. Paralysis, they can't move it. Or pressure or poikiothermy. So this is a temperature gradient. So these six Ps are really important looking for neurovascular compromise. One thing that can cause that would be compartmental syndrome. This is a result of something... Uh, being so tight, either the edema is that great or if there's a cast or something that's impinging on there and that area is unable to get blood flow into that site. So that's one of the main concerns. Um, but as we talk about casts here, they can be fiberglass or plastic. Most are fiberglass anymore because they're lighter weight and they, they dry a little bit faster. The plaster dries in about 24 to 48 hours. They're kind of messy. They can get some sharp edges on them where the fiberglass tend not to be as bad. The fiberglass also tend to be fun colors, so the kids can like that. So with casts, oftentimes we pedal them, meaning that we put mole skin around the edges of it so it's not so sharp. But in your textbook, you can kind of see that they, they do give some guidelines for cast care at home. Here's a good image of cast removal. That cutter sounds really scary. It, it looks sharp. And then it, it sounds nasty because uh, it's got a high-pitched whine to it like a regular saw does. So the kids don't always understand that that doesn't hurt. So you have to do some, some teaching with them and show them that it's all right. So traction. So traction is trying to realign those bones if it's dislocated um, or displaced, I should say. So pulling them apart so that they can grow together. Buck's traction is in your textbook. I don't see it a lot in practice. However, NCLEX loves this. Basically, this is a specialized boot that somebody will Velcro onto their foot. And on the end of it, there's a string that goes to a weight that hangs off the edge of the bed. And this is meant to pull bone away from bone so that they can heal right. Cervical traction, we could talk about halo braces, like what's pictured here. Or in very rare cases, I haven't seen these used in a long time but those are cervical tongs so with those halo braces oftentimes they've got a harness that they have to wear with rods going up and this halo is bolted into the skull and so it keeps it in line and it can put some traction on it so that they heal in a straight line So DDH happens about 1 in 100 live births, and it's a hip abnormality. So 
uh, one of these three things can happen, and so they can have a shallow acetabulum, um, and so this will lead into acetabular dysplasia. And basically, uh, it's a ball in a socket. So this is saying that uh, it's just shallow, and there's not uh, enough area to hold that in place. And so subluxation can happen, and that just means that it, it dislocates out. So with those dislocations, that femoral head loses contact with the acetabulum. It can be very painful for these kids that are um, suffering through this, or some kids get used to it and it doesn't cause much pain. So manifestations in a child would be, when you look at them, one leg is smaller than or shorter than the other one. Maybe they're not moving that one as much. When you've got them on their bellies, you look at their little folds in their butt, and you're going to see that one side is uneven. You can do the Orlatani and the Barlow test. That's when you take the, the knees up and you put them together and you bring them up to the chest and you spread them out. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to feel for a clunk or you're, you're trying to dislocate that hip. Treatment of DDH can include surgery in rare cases. Um, where I've commonly seen more often is pavlik harness, which is a picture down here. Otherwise, even double diapering can help. The earlier you catch this, the better off you will be, and these childs will have better response to therapy then. Um, ages 6 to 18 months, they can use traction, or they can use a spica cast. The spica cast is a big cast from uh, approximately your upper chest all the way down to your ankles. You've got a bar connecting your knees to kind of help hold it in place, and then it cuts out around the peritoneum area um, so that you can do diaper cares. Older child, um, they could do operative reduction, um, cut out some tendons, uh, maybe even take out some bone. But after the age of four, this is very difficult to treat and have success with. Congenital clubfoot, so this is an interning of the feet. Treatment for this that I've commonly seen is Ponsetti procedure. And basically, you're making casts of these feet. And over time, they realign and they straighten out. Osteogenesis imperfecta is also called brittle bone disease. And so this is a genetic disorder of the connective tissue and bone. And so they, the bone gets really frail and tends to fracture. Other things with OI includes hyperextendability, uh, so they kind of get double jointed with their ligaments. And the other thing in this picture, you're going to see like a blue sclera. Why it's concerning is, like I said, they can get brittle bones and they come in for fractures. Leg calf per these disease. So this is an idiopathic uh, event that commonly happens in obese males. But the femoral head actually loses blood flow. And becomes avascular and necrotic. Oftentimes, if you keep them off of that femur, no weight bearing, and you can treat them just with symptomatic like that. Very rarely do you have to do surgery on these patients, but most of them do not like it. Most of these cases are unilateral, but 10% can be bilateral. Skiffy, so slip capita femoral epiphysis is a sudden displacement of the proximal femoral epiphysis. And so the best way that I've ever heard it described on radiography is that the ice cream comes off the cone. So if you imagine that this is your cone, this is the ice cream that fell off. So this should be attached, but you can see that it's not. So treatment of this is going to be a screw and to hold that in place. So once again, it happens uh, around puberty, ages 10 to 16. A lot of these cases, there is some bilateral involvement. So if you've got it on one side, just be very leery that you might have it on the other side as well. After surgery, these patients typically do fairly well. Scoliosis is a common thing that we look for in children, and I'm guessing that you've heard of this. It's a very common spinal deformity and that affects all three planes of that spine. But the big thing that we'll notice first probably is that there's a lateral curvature. 
So if they bend over and they touch their toes, you're going to see a side-to-side -side movement of the spine and some rib asymmetry with that. So this can be from birth, otherwise it can develop during childhood. So treatment of this, it really takes a team. You're going to work with the orthopedic surgeon. You're going to be working with PT, OT. Um, you're going to be working with primary care providers, all to make sure that this uh, gets treated appropriately. One way to do the treatment is to wear a brace. This is a TLSO brace. It's very common in kids. Um, usually I do not see the teenager smiling about these braces braces because they're hot, they're uncomfortable, they make them stand out, and they make them different from their peers, so oftentimes they're not appreciative of these braces. Um, however, these braces are effective and they can prevent having to do a full-on surgery. Um, we do recommend some exercise and PT to try and strengthen up those muscles, but push come to shove that this can be a um, severe uh, surgery uh, and trying to fix that curvature of the spine. Be aware though once your body is adapted to that and then you fix it you can have some complications after surgery because your body was used to that um, imperfect shape. So here are some images of that. So this person's got a severe curvature, lateral curvature of the spine and they basically put in rods and then screws to hold those in place. And so straighten the spine, you can see that, but just be aware that if your body was used to this and then in a six hour surgery, it turns into this, you can have complications with respers, um, G2 track, uh, and some other bodily functions. Osteomyelitis, so this is an infection of the bone. Um, oftentimes this begins abruptly um, it can happen if there's some kind of an injury. Um, I've seen it from, you know, getting cleated in soccer or some other things like that. But what happens is you just get an infection of that bone. So, of course, you get a leukocytosis, uh, a marked raise up in the white blood cell count. Oftentimes for treatment of this, we're doing bone cultures, trying to get a biopsy or an aspirate. The number one cause of this is definitely staph aureus. Then, of course, we have to worry about if this is methicillin resistant or not, and what antibiotics we have to treat with. Early x-ray films may appear to be normal, so they're not a great guideline for this. Ultimately, bone scans will be necessary for diagnosis. If it's positive, they're going to be put on antibiotics and possibly even a, using a PICC line to provide good access um, and not worry about a peripheral IV falling out. We do have to watch their hem hematological system, the renal system, hepatic, all in regards to the antibiotics that we're using. And then we can do surgery on some of these patients too if it's severe enough. And they will go and they'll make holes into the bone and inject some antibiotics. That way the infection can leak out through those holes and the antibiotics can seep into that bone to better treat. Septic arthritis, so this is arthritis, but the joint is warm, tender, painful, and swollen. This is usually on only one side, which is a big concerning thing. Frequently this will follow traumatic injury. On presentation they can have fever, leukocytosis, and increased sed rate. One causative agent that we're especially concerned about is Neisseria gonorrhea because then that can indicate that the teen has been sexually active and has got an STI. Treatment of this is with antibiotics and this is wanting to be done fairly soon before you have scarring and other complications of that joint or of that bone. A tumor, so we can talk about osteosarcomas and sarcomas. Together those two are 85% of all malignant tumors bone tumors in kids. We don't see this a lot. Um, it does happen more commonly in males and where I've seen it more is in teenagers. So uh, treatment can be surgery and try and cut out the tumor, can be chemotherapy or it can be radiation or and or a combination of those three.
juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or GIA, um, used to be called juvenile rheumatoid uh, arthritis. Um, but what this is, it's an autoimmune disease where your body attacks itself. It causes immunogenic susceptibility um, within that person. Peak onset, it says here it's one to three. I've seen it a little bit older. The difficult thing with this is the diagnosing of it is very difficult. And oftentimes what I've seen is that it actually takes years for them to fully understand this and to get a good diagnosis of it. So some of the signs and symptoms include arthritis, joint deformity, functional deformity. Pharmacology for this can be a host of things, but oftentimes we're talking about NSAIDs, we're talking about anti-rheumatory or anti-rheumatic drugs, steroids, cytotoxic agents such as chemotherapy, immunologic modulators. So, and then management, they do want to get PTOT, get some pain relief, promote general health, facilitate compliance, and encourage exercise. And then, of course, support any family that's there. So lupus, this is a very broad and very complex issue, um, but this is tends to be chronic. It will wax and wane a little bit, but it's also a multi-system. And it happens, you know, it's as a result of uh, affecting your blood vessels. So, of course, anything that's vascular has a greater involvement. Oftentimes, there's lots of inflammation related to this. This happens more in ages 10 to 19, Females, more common in African American, Asian, and Hispanic children. And some of the symptoms that they might have would be a cutaneous lesions, lymphadenopathy, or a butterfly rash. This butterfly rash you can see here on this picture, and it's below the eyes and on the upper cheeks. It can also cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pain, generalized weakness. And honestly, this can kind of go on and on. And lupus can have a broad spectrum of signs and symptoms that affect the body in lots of different ways. Main goals of treatment is supportive care and then helping their body. We can see this with calming the body down with corticosteroids. Some anti-malarial meds have been used successfully with this. Some adsids called the body and some immunosuppressants. Nursing care and management is minimizing exacerbations with having good sleep, good nutrition, good exercise, and some exposure to UVB light. Therapy compliance is mixed on this. Uh, some people are very good about this, of course, and some are, uh, especially teenagers, are not as much. The bad thing about this, of course, though, is it can lead into body image concerns as it's quite noticeable by even strangers walking on the street. And so people tend to be very cons uh, concerned about this outwardly. This wraps up the lecture on musculoskeletal dysfunction. If you have any questions on this, please feel free to contact me.